When you build a robot that looks even anything like a human, the expectation management is, is really challenging. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the consumer or the business says, gosh, this needs to operate like C-3PO or K-2SO or any, you know, pick your notable, you know, humanoid robot from what science fiction has shown us. So, you know, that focus on expectation management um, is just a challenge we still haven't really been able to get over yet in the human-centric space. Welcome to The Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. In this episode of The Future Of, we're joined by Jonathan Hurst and James Dietrich to explore the future of human-centric robots. Uh, given how fast uh, the robotic space has been progressing and how the, such a rich, deep history we have in this space, we're excited to, for this dis discussion and to, to learn from both of you as, as people, experts that have been in this space for quite some time. Uh, if we can start with you, Jonathan, would you care to tell the lis listeners a little bit more about yourself, also about agility? Um, where you're both a founder and the CTO. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I um, have been thinking about legged locomotion, walking and running, and physical interaction in general um, my whole career. And, um, you know, that's taken me through an academic path. I was a professor before this, studying biomechanics uh, of animals, studying reduced order models, simulations, and then if you really understand something, you should be able to reproduce it, right? So figuring out how to capture the principles of physics, uh, how do these things work, and make robots that capture those core physics and really demonstrate walking and running in the, in the same way that you see an animal doing it. Um, that's, I don't know, that's, that's my background in a, in a nutshell. And uh, co-founded this company because uh, I want to make a difference with it. You know, that's an enabling technology. If you can build robots that go where people go and can really interact with the world in uh, many of the same ways that people people can, right? Uh, our, our vision is to enable humans to be more human. And it's about having robots that come into our world and our environment, uh, do a lot of the dull, dirty, dangerous, do a lot of things that we'd rather not do, um, and help us really enable people to do the things that people are good at, the uh, decision making, the variety, the you know, creativity, the ambition, all of those things. These robots are really useful tools, and that's what we want to create. Amazing. Notice that Agility recently raised you know 150 million Series B. Been reading about the company in the news uh, with everything that you've you've accomplished. Hearing about you know successful pilots with customers and more. So it's impressive. You also have a background you mentioned in academia at the university. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. I, so I came through the Robotics Institute at uh, Carnegie Mellon. That's the, the oldest robotics program in the world and uh, uh, the, by far the largest. And certainly at the time when I was there, um, I then came over to Oregon State and uh, helped to co-found the robotics program that we have there now um, with over uh, 100 graduate students and earning PhDs and masters in robotics. So it's, it's a great robotics program. Um, and, and the core of my research there, again, was understanding legged locomotion. But it was at that point, what are some of the core science pieces of it? It wasn't so much the engineering or a useful um, application or use case. At the time, it was, can we make a robot that is able to really capture the core dynamics that we see in animals, walk and run and get kind of the efficiency, um, the robustness? Uh, you know, that means walking and running outdoors over all kinds of terrain. And, and we, we succeeded at that. Um, our robot Atrius, and if you Google Atrius, you know, robot, uh, A-T-R-I-A-S, you'll, you'll find a bunch of videos of it. It doesn't look anything like an animal. It, um, it's a big contraption, you know, and it, it has more in common with like high speed pick and place robot arms than, than something that looks like a, a person or a, or, a, or a bird. But the whole point of that robot was to just capture a, a math model that is from biomechanics and to demonstrate that this math model really can describe the behaviors and get what we want. And it did, once we kind of captured the right physics and had the controller to the point where it, it uh, settled into the right dynamics, we were walking and running, accelerating you know, to different speeds, going outdoors over grass and gravel and pavement. And uh, you know, that was really the demonstration then. 
that um, allowed us to then spin out and start the company. And I joined up with uh, my good friend from grad school, uh, Damian Shelton, who had been uh, started a company while I was a professor and sold it. So he had gone down the entrepreneurial route and he came out as CEO. And uh, my student, Mikhail Jones, who was really responsible for the code that made Atrius walk and run successfully. So at that point then, we developed the Cassie robot. That was our first product at the company, and we started to build and grow from there. Awesome. I, I was recently reading about the Guinness World Record that uh, was set, and I saw your name in that article. Uh, can you tell us just a, briefly about that before we move over to James? Sure. So that's the Cassie robot I just mentioned. And uh, Cassie was, like I said, the very first product that Agility Robotics sold. It's just a bipedal robot sold to you know the research market for the purpose of trying to figure out control algorithms for walking, running, and so on. And so that's what my lab at the university has been doing in parallel as we've been building out the company, Agility Robotics. Um, one of the things that you can do at a university that you can't do at a company is blue sky ideas. Just try something. You're not sure if it's going to work. You know, let's check it out. NS National Science Foundation, DARPA kinds of things. And um, so our at that point, our real focus was to say, hey, there's a lot of limitations to the con control methods that we're using now. There's a lot of limitations to uh, an engineer being able to write down a model, a human understandable model, or a human understandable equation and describe the behavior that you want. We're going to need to figure out something that more like machine learning, more like some sort of optimization tools in order to really create this complex, nonlinear, strange behavior. We know a lot about the behavior. We can write down kind of um, all the symptoms that we see in the behavior. Um, you know, we started with, uh, say, running pretty quickly on a treadmill, and we took it out to do our first uh, outdoor run. And it was interesting, the, the crown of the road was enough slant that we hadn't modeled and hadn't tested that that destable, then we were able to run a 5K uh, outdoors on about a half a battery um, on Cassie. Um, and then that's progressed. The robot can go up and down stairs and is completely blind. Um, and then recently uh, ran that 100 meter dash and broke the world record for speed. Um, and what's really exciting about that is that now is really outperforming any of the uh, control methods that we used before. So this machine learning approach is just a really promising way. Congratulations. Uh, that, that, that's fun. And it's, it's interesting to hear about that duality of having kind of the depth and sort of being able to explore the unknown with academia, but then also having the reality of business. And James, if, um, if you can tell us more about your experience uh, with robotics and also with uh, human-centric humanoid robots. Sure, absolutely. Um, I come from just the completely other side of the spectrum from Jonathan. Uh, I was really fortunate to stumble my way into robotics uh, with a French company back in 2013 called Aldebaran Robotics uh, that was then later acquired by SoftBank. Um, but yeah, the, the focus was more on just the humanoid side of robots versus just what we're talking about with more sort of broadly human-centric robots. Um, the flagship product was uh, something called the Now uh, Humanoid Robot. Uh, and it was really focused around, you know, expanding upon human robot interaction and specifically those social interactions. Uh, the founder of the company, you know, after a really awful heat wave that had rolled through France and took the lives of several, you know, elderly folks who needed some more assistance in the home to remind them to drink water or take their medications or, you know, keep themselves safe and healthy, uh, prompted him to want to start a company where, you know, he envisioned a future where these types of humanoid robots could serve a really valuable purpose in the home, uh, and, you know, really servicing a, an aging population that, you know, needed that additional support. Uh, and so, you know, I was more on the sort of go to market and the business development side. We were selling this robot to, you know, academia for, again, advanced human robot interaction research. Uh, we realized it had a really powerful place in the STEM education world uh, and helping to teach young kids how to, you know, write code and program, you know, robots to mimic certain types of human interactions and, you know, create the type of, you know, robot friend uh, and engagements, you know, they would want. Um, we found some, you know, interesting value in using the robots in retail and other healthcare settings. Um, a lot of really impressive work with the autism community. Um, from there, I was, you know, fortunate enough to make a move to a company called Sarcos Robotics, which was and is doing some incredible work in sort of advanced exoskeleton 
uh, development, you know, really taking the sort of intelligence, the judgment and decision making of humans and pairing that with the strength and durability and reliability of, you know, robots. And so uh, it was kind of neat to see, you know, human centric robotics from two very opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, and then over the last few years, I've been at uh, Fresh Consulting um, and really given a, a fantastic opportunity to help other companies who are trying to solve really challenging and complex, you know, issues within their businesses with different types of robots and automation. So, you know, really focusing on helping people see the the value and the positivity that robots can bring into, you know, helping humans operate more efficiently or safely in any number of working environments. Appreciate you being on the show. Jonathan, for you, how do you how do you define sort of human centric robots and kind of make some of those distinctions? Help us understand that a little bit better. You know, it's it's challenging. What do we call our robot? Uh, you know, Agility Robotics is building a robot that does look a bit like a person, so it's often called humanoid. Um, but it's really designed to do useful work in the world. It's designed, you know, it's made to say initial applications, pick up totes in warehouses, move them to conveyor belts, and move them around. Kind of these these um, very process automated jobs that are extremely repetitive. And um, that's, that's a ripe for kind of automation. So, um, but the robot's really made to operate with people and for people and um, be a partner to people. So what we're not trying to do is make a robot that looks like a person. The, the, the reason it may look something like a person is because it's made for human environments. Um, but, you know, everything about it is entirely function first, uh, kind of first principles. How are we best going to be able to do the useful task in the world? And how are we best going to be able to interface with the people that are the partners to the robot? So, you know, that's a, it's a, in some ways a nuanced distinction because you can get a uh, human morphology by copying a person and being, you know, biomimicry and saying, well, I'm, I'm going to make a humanoid that has the same face, the same five fingers, the same everything as a person. Or you can make something that ends up looking a little bit like a person because you're trying to do some of the same useful kinds of physical interaction tasks. That's the nuance we're trying to get at, at human-centric. We are not trying to build a robot to copy how people look. Uh, we are trying to build a robot that does useful things and is a partner to people in human environments. And I would just add to that, if I could, Jeff, you know, it's the unique combination of several things that kind of make humans human. Uh, and, you know, not all human centric robots have to incorporate all of them. Um, you know, not all human centric robots have to have legs or arms. You know, there's a lot of different categories of things that make sense to me that sort of occupy this category around, you know, are you focused on advanced dexterity? Are you like Jonathan and other companies who are, you know, highly focused on the maneuverability? Um, others, you know, are creating, you know, robots that are really around, you know, the sensing, the vision, perception, you know, the the AI and ML, you know, associated with that. Um, you know, others are approaching it from a durability standpoint. So there's there's a lot of different facets of what a human centric robot could be. One more comment though on like on the human centric on say biomimicry versus bio inspired, right? Have you heard of um have you heard of the cargo cults? I, I don't know the exact, I don't remember the exact details of the story, but I think it was uh, World War II era. And um, the story is that, you know, for a long time, there were supply drops coming into some of these Pacific islands. And, you know, people on the ground with headphones and things and waving their, you know, for the airplanes to come in to tell them where to drop. For years after that, there were people on the island who had no idea what the technology was. And they would put like fashion things that looked like headphones and wave sticks, hoping that supplies would drop. But, you know, even if it looks like it, that's like biomimicry. That's something where you're copying some feature of it that actually isn't the relevant one. Um, Bio-inspired would be really understanding deeply why something works the way it does, deciding if that's a really useful feature for what you want to implement, and then doing that. And so, you know, when our robots end up looking a little bit like human form, it's, it's understanding why and doing it for that functional reason, um, which I think is very different from having the appearance um, be similar. Yeah. Yeah, and if we're gonna have if we're gonna have robots, you know, work with us, integrate in some of the work we do, or support us, they're they're operating in our world. You know, they're they're connected into our world. So ha there's there's aspects where they they need to fit in too, right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, so that's the human robot interaction aspect of it, right? How are people going to react to these things, and that matters. But that's a functional choice. Absolutely, and you know, 
Jonathan, you might know him, but, uh, you know, Louis Sentis, who leads the UT Austin human centric, you know, robot lab, you know, he kind of talks about two really interesting facets of kind of robot intelligence, uh, one of which is, you know, intervention, you know, building a robot with logic that assesses a situation for optimal out, you know, actions. And, you know, we talked about this a while ago, which is, you know, your your standard washing machine, your mo modern washing machine kind of has this intervention like capability where it's going to, you know, operate, you know, based on the load it senses inside of it or how dirty it might sense it would be, you know, a smart thermostat is some of the same way. But that concept of intervention and intelligence in future human centric robots is a little scary, um, as well as, you know, this other aspect of self efficacy. You know, basically, you know, robots that have the, the self confidence to achieve a certain behavior or task and, and how can they, you know, grow and expand upon that over time. Uh, there's just two really interesting, but also, you know, potentially, uh, you know, polarizing aspects of that. We see a lot of uh, robots in our in our space. We're working with lots of different robot companies. What makes, uh, Jonathan, what makes some of the core components of human-centric robots unique from other robots? All right. So safety is a big one. Big question. Humans obviously are a lot better about manipulating things than than robots are in many cases. And, and the opposite is true in other cases. So if you think, for example, about um, a CNC machine, right? And they can make super precise parts. And if you as a human hold a woodworking router and then try to freehand you know, a shape in wood, humans are not as good at that as a robot is. Um, so there's a lot of things robots do that are really impressive and that's great. But then there's a lot of things that humans do that just robots can't. And a lot of that has to do with uh, um, not just force sensitivity, but that's a big one. It's knowing what forces you're applying and then being able to control those forces. But it's, it's even more nuanced than that. It's having a uh, preset, it's having a set of dynamics that are already kind of described. And, and maybe an example of that would be like a physical pogo stick, right? It's a physical spring, it's a physical system, and that system wants to bounce. And then you can bounce on a pogo stick. But then a really sophisticated version of that would be, you know, your hand and the way the tendons are and the specific compliance of the tendon and the specific non-round shape of each knuckle such that you have a configuration dependent, you know, um, gear ratio basic and, and, and all of these structures in how the muscles are. Um, all of that kind of stuff is, is, call it engineered dynamics. You're setting up a behavior that's a combination of the passive dynamics of the physical hardware and also the software control and how that happens. So, you know, figuring out how to do that with a robot is going to be a, a long term, 100 years plus kind of effort to really understand how to do great physical interaction with the world. And I think that's, you know, the thing I'm excited about with with um, um, with our robots, with, you know, robots that operate in human spaces, robots that do things that are useful. Uh, with digit, it's a little bit like it's a platform. It's like a smartphone, you know, and how many different features and things can you do on your smartphone, but it's all based on data and information. So now all the stupid apps that you have on your phone that, you know, that nobody would have imagined when they first started coming out with the, the smartphone, that's the kind of thing that's going to be useful on, on a digit robot. Um, because it's going to be able to physically interact with the world and not just provide data and information to you. We know agility is a main player in the space, so it's really uh, fun to watch their growth, and we're excited about mm -hmm. their future. What are examples of other organizations and companies that are that are in this space as well? Absolutely, you know, I think some of the the sort of leading ones that come to mind that are doing really meaningful things. Obviously, agility being you know one of the key players there. I think if you're talking about companies like agility, you clearly have to mention you know Boston Dynamics as well, who you know are doing equally impressive things with their bipedal and quadrupedal robots, and you know that can dance and do parkour and you know have really impressive agility and balance. Um, Shadow Robot is another one that comes to mind. You know, they're focused on a really specific area where it's really about advanced, you know, robot dexterity and manipulation. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, our world being designed by humans for humans and being able to, you know, mimic human hands and that level of dexterity and sensitivity is, is equally important along that sort of journey to kind of bringing all of these things together. Um, my father is alive today because of the intuitive surgical robot. Uh, the Da Vinci robot, um, I would still argue, kind of falls into this broader category because of its, you know, integrated and sort of intelligent and intuitive, you know, capabilities. 
Um, Jonathan, you mentioned earlier, you know, Honda and the Osimo robot is just everyone's kind of seen it or it's, you know, a widely associated robot in the space, um, although it's, you know, not really been advanced or sort of done meaningful things in the real world, but it inspired a lot of people and it kind of shed the light on what was possible or, you know, what could be possible. Um, Sarcos, I mentioned, were, you know, I worked previously you know, making huge advances in, you know, robotic exoskeleton technology and, you know, kind of pairing human and robot skin, you know, kind of around it in a really unique way. And again, kind of combining that human intelligence, instincts and judgments with robotic strength, endurance and, and precision. You know, those are all really, you know, big stepping stones and strides to kind of bringing humans and robots together. Uh, and so, you know, those are a couple of companies that come to mind that are, you know, really taking this space, you know, by, you know, by force and, and doing really meaningful work in it. I mean, it's been a dream, you know, of humanity forever. You know, Rosie the robot. Um, before people understood technology, it was a dream, automatons and things like that. I mean, in fact, the word robot was even coined, you know, in a movie about automatons before technology existed, right? So it's just, it's interesting how we're kind of at a point where it's starting to become possible to do this. So a lot of people are starting to realize this is possible. Once you see a few examples of it, right? A few companies start to raise money, a few companies start to produce a product. Others say, hey, you know, I want to do that and start to get into the game. And that's exciting. That's exciting. There is certainly going to be, you know, a large amount of space for many different types of human centric robot companies to, you know, have a field of play. Um, you know, I think there's still a lot of reasons why these robots are still failing. Um, you know, the, the company that I worked for previously, you know, the, the now humanoid robot and the pepper robot, you know, we struggled with, you know, advancements in natural language processing. Um, you know, our robots were intended to speak, you know, 20 different languages, be able to communicate back and forth with humans. And we discovered pretty early on that the robot had a really tar hard time speaking to little children and understanding, you know, the nuances of their sort of speech patterns and how they pronounce, you know, enunciated words and similarly with the elderly. Uh, and so, you know, that's just kind of one, you know, nuance area where, you know, that robot sort of failed, if you will. Um, but right now, I think there's still a big challenge with, you know, cost versus utility. Um, you know, most human centric robots have been, you know, prohibitively expensive with, you know, limited sets of capabilities and value they can offer. So I think we're going to be looking at, you know, watching that, that curve come down over the next several years. In addition to the conversation we had with our guests on today's episode, we asked another expert to provide their insights on the future. Hi everyone, I'm Grace. I'm one of the co-founders of Andromeda Robotics, which is an early stage robotics startup here in Melbourne where we build healthcare humanoid companion robots for Australia's elderly and disability healthcare sector. I'm a mechatronics graduate from Melbourne University and a self-proclaimed mathematician. Engineers, storytellers and scientists have been obsessed for so many hundreds of years of creating a system that so eloquently simulates the behaviours and traits of us. And so I think what would be really cool is seeing how how well that simulated, I guess, digital twin of us, how well we can actually emotionally connect with this system, how well, like when we engage with them, do we get the impression that they are an independent autonomous being or just how compelling that is. I'm glad you kind of touched on that. Because we have a long history with humanoid robots, we we, we talked about this with with Honda and others, and and Jonathan, you'd saying, hey, this is where the robot was coined. Uh, so th this isn't new, but kind of what's changing right now that that kind of positions us in a in a better chance for success. Jo uh, Jonathan, interested in your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, I think maybe I'll start by pointing out that there's a lot that. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot that's really hard for a robot to do in terms of manipulation and physical interaction with the world. And certainly that doesn't change if a robot is shaped like a humanoid or is a you know, six axis robot arm. It's still a really hard problem. So even if you shape it like a humanoid, you're gonna have to understand those dynamics and pieces. Even if it looks like something that should be able to do that job, um, looking like it can and actually being able to are very different things. So yeah, the, the proof's in the pudding. Now. I'll say there's a couple things that I've observed really shifting um, in recent years. And one of them is kind of the basic science. You know, I, I focus maybe on the legged locomotion piece because that's, that's kind of the, 
I think of legged locomotion as one of the hardest possible physical interaction tasks. It's not a fine manipulation task, but it's um, a mobile robot that has to apply large enough forces to lift itself off the ground. It has regular impacts with the ground over and over and over. Um, and then it's got to apply those forces throughout stance and then have some sort of a swing phase. So you've, you've got this kind of model where you're swinging your lightweight you know, leg or limb or whatever it is, and then the model switches when you impact the ground, and now you're trying to move the mass of the robot. So that's a hybrid system. It, it's just incredibly complicated. Now, I, I've heard people describe running as um, you know, juggling yourself. And uh, so if you think about you know, now if I'm going to juggle uh, a mass or something like that, you know, that's, that's a hard physical interaction task. So if we can really tackle um, the hardware and the software to get us to do all different kinds of gates and behaviors, uh, we're also going to be able to manipulate boxes and packages and things like that using a lot of the exact same tools and a lot of the same understanding um, on the engineering on the hardware side. Of course, different special t you know, specialized engineering system for each, but the, the, the principles are there. So, you know, I'd say 10 or 20 years ago, even though we are familiar with seeing animals and humans do amazing physical interaction and walking and running tasks, the actual understanding of how that works, being able to write down the equation that describes how that works and then do some engineered system that can reproduce it is um, you know, very, very limited, just from a basic science understanding. And, and we understand so much more now. Um, and like I mentioned, Atreus is the first machine to reproduce human walking gait dynamics. That's kind of a big deal, right? It's never been understood before to the point where you can reproduce it. Now it has. That will never change, right? It's something that is now understood. How does walking work? You can write down an equation, you can build a system, and you can get those same kind of dynamics and behaviors. Still a ton to figure out, of course, but there's some core science things about understanding that. And that understanding is just broadening in the world. There's, you know, when I was a graduate student, the Dynamic Walking Conference started. And it started with four of us, you know, at a coffee house. It's grown to a really big regular conference. And all of those people have gone out and joined companies, started companies, become professors, et cetera. And that knowledge is really starting to become um, much more broadly understood. So some of the basic science. And then the other piece of it is, how do you coordinate, say, 26, 30 motors, uh, you know, 100 plus sensors, including complex ones like cameras and LIDAR and things like that? but also all of the encoders and all of the thermal sensors and everything. So just think, you've got hundreds of sensors giving you data. Now write an equation or an algorithm that then outputs torque to 30 different motors and then coordinate that to play basketball, you know? I mean, so, you know, 20 years ago, it was much more about, can I control a six degree of freedom arm using inverse dynamics, inverse kinematics, and so on. And, and now it's uh, starting to open up as people understand various uh, learning techniques, um, optimization techniques, uh, figure out control hierarchies that use reduced order models and map those to the more complex systems, and in real time be able to control that many degrees of freedom with that much data coming in from sensors. That's also a new kind of enabling technology. Those two things coming together, that's why you're starting to really see some success out of robots. Just to add to that, Jonathan, if I can, we talked about it. I mean, you know, what, what makes humans innately unique is, you know, we have bones, we have skin, we have things that make us very durable and reliable in a otherwise, you know, really chaotic world that we live in. Uh, and that sort of concept of sensory skin for robots and things that make them equally as durable and reliable in our world is kind of a new area where I'm excited to see some additional advancement. I mean, allowing robots to respond to human touch, but within the context of the other information it's receiving from its environment, you know, really learning when and how to be delicate when necessary or forceful when necessary. You know, we've seen early stage, you know, robots for manufacturing, but they were relegated to cages because it wasn't safe for humans to be around them. Now we're entering the time of, you know, really great cobots that are now working much more closely, you know, without those types of safety barriers around humans. And now that next evolution is how can we create advanced you know, sensory and perception and skin for robots where, yeah, now they're just that much more in tune and aware of, you know, their place in our environment. And you know what's um, interesting, too, when you think about, again, looking at this bio-inspired idea, um, you think, wow, animals, humans are so amazing. There must be, everything must be just really optimal in how those sensors work, how those actuators work and muscles and things. They're not. 
human muscles are um, really not ideal for a lot of the things that uh, that we do. There's a whole lot of uh, I would call it compromises that are made because of the limitations of the dynamics of a human muscle. And that's where a huge amount of the complexity in our muscular structure comes from, is physical adaptations to deal with the fact that, hey, our actuators aren't that great for what we're trying to do with them. Um, and so similarly, when you're trying to use electric motors instead of uh, muscle, uh, they have a very different set of limitations or a hydraulic system or whatever. It's a different set of real limitations that then you have to figure out how to engineer around to get that behavior that you actually want. Um, that's a very deep problem. People are going to be working on that for a long time. And I would argue just, you know, because a human has the strongest and biggest muscles, it doesn't make them, you know, ideal and adept at all activities. You know, you look at rock climbers, you know, a lot of them, you know, need to be lean and a little bit more agile. And it's not necessarily the person with the biggest muscles that, you know, can climb the best, you know, rock faces. And just as, you know, within robots, yeah, how strong or, you know, capable you are from kind of a muscle replication standpoint doesn't necessarily mean that that robot's more valuable, more capable. We have, you know, lots of different types of robots, um, AMRs, AGVs, you know, drones, uh, arms, crawlers, etc. Where do we see, you know, people buying these right now? And where are they most useful relative to, let's say, other types of robots? Uh, right now, it's in kind of in warehouses, in logistics. Um, it's such a, a huge industry, and it's growing so, so fast. Everybody wants their packages delivered in one day, you know. And uh, I know my family, we don't really go to the grocery store anymore. We, we want them to be either delivered or right now we have to go pick them up. But there's businesses working on how to get that autonomous and delivered to your home in an actually cost-effective way. And, and that kind of thing really improves quality of life. I know it re improves ours. It, it, it gives us back time to be more human, to do what we would like to do with our time rather than um, chores. Um, so, you know, Digit's going to be moving. Our first application is just moving totes, the, those plastic totes that, you know, the uh, fulfillment centers get filled with the things that people order. And then you need to move it from kind of that automated, you know, filling system over to a conveyor belt and it's taken off or you take the empty totes and you stack them. And um, with the, the pressure and the growth on, on that kind of role, it's changing very rapidly. And so having a robot that's multi-purpose, that's pretty flexible, that can do different workflows. Um, and in an area where it's really, really hard to hire people to do those jobs, it's not really a, a fun job, uh, typically. Um, and you know, I, I guess aside from judgment calls on it, there's incredibly high turnover, very, very high turnover in, in most of those roles. So it's a real struggle. Um, and having a robot that can just come in and kind of fill in and augment that human workforce and do some of those tasks early on is, is really valuable. So that's kind of the first application. But, you know, purpose-built specialty automation is always going to be kind of nipping at the heels of applications like that. You know, eventually in, in 100 years, what are, you know, what are warehouses going to look like? Or, or 20 years? Or what do warehouses look like now? Well, if you build one from scratch, there's an awful lot of purpose-built automation coming in. So at some point, you know, the autonomous truck backs up, things get sifted and sorted, autonomous trucks fly out. That's what it's going to look like someday, right? But the forever use cases for these, uh, for robots like, like Digit um, that are really focused on human spaces and human environments is like, say, delivering out of the autonomous vehicle to your porch. Um, that's always going to be a human environment. You're always going to, we design that around ourselves. You're going to have your front walk, little stairs, the gate to open. People to you know who are going to be in the way, or pets, or children, or toys, or you know, and so that kind of application, and in our spaces, and in our homes, and in our workplaces, where um, we've designed our whole environment around us, those are the forever homes in the future when these machines are safe enough, smart enough, you know, to really to really get there. Yeah, I'd add just, you know, kind of a unique story. Um, I had, you know, the privilege of going to UNESCO in New York at the UN headquarters to kind of speak in front of some students as part of their summer program. And I had our, you know, small little humanoid robot with with me just to kind of demonstrate kind of some of the work our company was doing. And there was a young boy in the in the room that said, hey, I really don't like what you're doing. You're putting my dad's, you know, career at risk and, you know, you're going to replace him with with robots. And I don't like that. And I said, well, what does your dad do? And he said, well, you know, he sort of pushes buttons and, you know, moves levers at a factory. 
I said, that's great. It sounds like he's provided a great life for you. But let me ask you an important question. I said, do you want to do the job that your dad does? And you could just kind of see the light bulb go off his head. And no, the answer was no. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, we are coming into a, a time in the evolution of robots where, yes, there are generations coming up right now that shouldn't want to and don't want to, you know, do these mundane, dull, dirty, dangerous jobs that, you know, maybe their parents have done in previous years. But, you know, that's not just a light switch. You don't just wake up tomorrow and thousands of people are displaced and out of jobs. It's a slow drip. And for every, you know, job that's being replaced by a robot, there's two to three new jobs being created for people who need to monitor, manage, and, you know, operate different facets of those robot capabilities. And so I think it's just, it's an important nuance. And and Jonathan, I think, made a fantastic distinction there between, hey, there's a value in last mile delivery. But then there's also this other piece of the puzzle of the last 50 feet, you know, that could be done with a drone, but more likely it's going to be done with something that looks human centric because, yeah, it's got to open, you know, a gate. It's got to walk up your steps. It's got to maybe greet your your barking dog in the front yard. And so, you know, I see a world where, you know, the, the harmony and duality of, you know, wheeled autonomous type vehicles and legged, you know, robots and drones kind of all work harmoniously in solving tasks joint you know another uh, point on some of these you, you're talking james about the jobs that have been created or that will be created it's really hard to imagine them all like i have a lot of faith that there will but think back to things that have also changed our world I, again the smartphone um who could have thought of at the time i don't know uber airbnb um tiktok influencers um i mean there's so many things that have that are jobs that are careers that have all come out of that that man you couldn't have imagined at the time So there's really two most evident use cases for humanoid robotics. First would be industrial humanoid robots who you often find around in your industrial manufacturing settings, taking over all of the really extremely laborious and repetitive tasks that people are currently still conducting in today's industrial environments in a post-industrial, even after the industrial revolution. So that would be the first case. The second one would be sort of the ones that I'm more focused on, which are healthcare companion robots designed to provide social and mental support for more vulnerable demographics in society today. So this is the area that I'm most passionate about. I think it brings a more holistic perspective to the applications of humanoid robots because it's not just focused on their robotics dexterity, but it's more so focused on how they as a system can positively impact the day-to-day lives of millions of people from an emotional perspective. You know, these last few years have have created new demand, but they've also created new challenges, you know, supply chain challenges, as an example. Um, Agility seems to be still fast at work uh, in producing units. Mm -hmm. Um, How have the last few years sort of affected uh, your, your company? Yeah, as, you know, it's a de- definitely a double-edged sword. Um, I will say that su- supply chain stuff has been really challenging. You know, we, we need to be iterating very quickly on our hardware reps. And some of these, these the timelines for getting components and parts in have just really extended in, in ways that are very hard to deal with. And we've been redesigning circuit boards regularly to deal with parts that are just no longer available. And we have to change the design to find a part that is available. So that adds some friction. Um, obviously work from home and so on has been challenging as well when you have to physically build something. Um, but we've managed that, you know, we've made it through that. Um, our company has been, um, by coastal since its inception. Uh, Damien, our CEO lives in Pittsburgh and we're building out our office there. We have our office here in Oregon. And so all of our processes have kind of enabled us to, to continue to function pretty well through that. Um, on the other hand, people's attitudes have really changed about automation when they realized how much, um, tools like this can improve their quality of life and the things that they rely on. And people's perception of risk, of what's dangerous in the dull, dirty, dangerous has changed. Um, and, and that's really helped us. People now look at the possibilities of what a machine like Digit can do for them and how that's really gonna improve things um, a lot more now. And that just a cultural shift has been has been great because it's it's not new, it's something that You know, those of us who've been in robotics for a long time, the the data shows kind of the value of this. And and those of us who've thought it through and been in it for a long time, maybe see it or have examples of it. Um, But it's it's a new thing, 
you know, as it starts to shift from movies being the primary perception that people have about robots to examples in the market that people have and starting to get a much more nuanced and um, better understanding. I, I, it, it's a really valuable and important shift. It's, you know, I'll say the movies are great because let's explore the fears and the dangers first. Let's make sure that we all ask those hard questions first and then start to really dig in deeper. And to touch on something you brought up earlier, Jonathan, you know, I, I still believe there's kind of a stepping stone where these task specific droids, if you will, things that don't have kind of a human centric design are kind of paving the way for acceptance and social adoption of future human centric robots. Because today, when you build a robot that looks even anything like a human, the expectation management is is really challenging. You know, all of a sudden, you know, the consumer or the business says, gosh, this needs to operate like C-3PO or K-2SO or any, you know, pick your notable, you know, humanoid robot from what science fiction has showed us. So, you know, that focus on expectation management um, is just a challenge we still haven't really been able to get over yet in the human centric space. One of the things that's really important, if you're building a robot, you know, that's multi-purpose, does a lot of things and, and is meant to be working with and around people, you don't want it to surprise people. You don't want people to be shocked by it or have it do something that, you know, that they think is creepy or, we, you know, if its head turns 360 degrees or the elbows bend backwards, you know, they're going to step back and really be concerned about it like if a person would, because that's, that's part of the interaction. So, you know, judging how people react to, say, Digit when we're walking outside on the sidewalk, um, you know, maybe half of people pull out their cell phones or want to talk about it or look at it, but man, fully half of people or more just walk by as if we were out walking our dog or something. And that's great. That's exactly the kind of reaction we want. You want these things. Once the novelty is worn off, you want them to fade into the background and people to basically have an inherent trust for them and, and having them move in a natural way, having them look a certain way. That is how you generate that kind of reaction. As we pan into the to kind of see into the future a little bit, you know, you talked about, you know, warehouse use and sort of logistics. Where do we see this space going in the next 20 to 40 years? You know, there's a lot of, we talked about the convergence of so much technology. What do we see in the future? Um, I'd like to get both of your thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, you know, we've been thinking about this a bit. I, I think of it because this is like the strategic plan for our company, right? We're not building a, a tote manipulation robot. We're building a robot that's going to be part of everyday life. But it's not going to be part of everyday life tomorrow or next year. It's going to be a while. So we kind of break it out into technology eras. And, you know, the, the technology era, maybe number five, is where you're going to be able to talk to this robot. You're going to be able to ask it to help you and do things. It's going to be, um, I don't know, you, you've seen Dolly, right? And the, the AI-generated art. You basically talk to this thing, and it generates an image. And you can say, uh, no, no, erase that chair, you know, add this. Uh, no, not like that. Do it in this style. And you can have, basically, a conversation with this thing to create um, something that you want, in this case, an image. But for robots in the future, it's going to be actions and, and uh, tasks and things you want it to do. Uh, and, and having it just be helping around the house, that is clearly the future. Everybody wants that. It's going to be possible. So it's completely inevitable. So the question is, you know, who's going to do it? What are the details of exactly how it's going to look and so on? Okay, so that's the goal. Step one, you know, technology era number one, that's where we are right now. And this is make something useful to a customer today. Do something immediately that's going to have a return on the investment for the customer um, so that they want to buy more. That's how you build a business, right? And um, for us, that's moving totes. That's picking up, uh, you know, it's a relatively structured environment. You know what you're picking up. You have some choices about where it goes, but not too many choices. Um, and the safety is really straightforward because you can have it be aware of people and people can be trained who are around it. It's not the public. So that's step one. Step two is scale that. Now, how do you deal with fleets of thousands of robots, all of the information security, you know, um, starting to get statistical information about the safety and about what breaks and durability and, um, you know, start to incorporate all of these, uh, you know, much bigger fleet kind of software challenges. Okay. The next step, I think, is starting to break out into multi-purpose. So we've been moving totes around. We've got two or three or four different workflows of how we move totes in different ways. We start to break out into now we're depalletizing and manipulating cardboard boxes and then start to unload tractor trailers and then start, you know, start to do a whole bunch, a hundred different workflows of moving totes and boxes around warehouses and things like that. And now the safety takes a step up. 
because the machines are going to be walking from task to task in warehouses where people are going to be walking by them as well. But they're still employees. They still can be trained. They can even, you know, the robot is in its known mapped environment um, and it's still totally feasible. So tens of thousands of robots, you know, moving and manipulating and doing things. The, um, the next era, I would say, is third parties, um, uh, customers perhaps, programming the robots to do what they want them to do. So it's a straightforward, you know, it's a very mature API at this point. Maybe it's even a graphical interface and maybe it's the kind of, you know, point and, and you know, set waypoints for it. And you kind of, as you would teach a, you know, very, very inexperienced, you know, high school student to do this job, you now have an interface and you're kind of teaching the robot to do that job. And then that's, you know, where these things start to become much more general purpose and, and it's not a team of engineers creating the task for it. It's now a platform that other people can in, 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 um, tell the robots what to do. Then the next stage after that is, you know, that final kind of era, which is the forever spot of you can talk to these things and interact with them. And, and it's a platform for it, it, it switches from being a commercial product to a consumer product at that point. And just building off that last point, Jonathan, my my sort of perspective on the future and, and something that's, you know, a personal passion of mine is just, you know, robots for, you know, senior care. You know, right now, globally, we're seeing a, an incredible shortage of, you know, hospice nurses, people who can help uh, senior citizens continue to age gracefully, but also age in place. Um, and so, yeah, I, I believe, you know, very firmly that where human centric robots are going to, you know, crack the egg and, and really show their value and place in our world is in taking care of our seniors. Um, and to your point, you know, taking this sort of iPhone model, you know, taking and expanding on what we see today with your standard Echo and kind of Alexa enabled device where, you know, this is now something that can communicate with you. It can remind you to be healthy, to be safe help you with recipes, help you with, you know, shopping lists and things around the house um, that, you know, will allow, allow people to age gracefully and, and, you know, in place. All right. So let's pick a, a timing on that. I think that when the three of us are in our 80s, in our 90s, I do think our kids are going to be able to buy us a robot to help us around the house. Nice. I agree. Hopefully sooner. <laughs> yeah, hopefully sooner. But man, it's not easy, right? No. Think of it this way. Um, when we are building robots to move totes in a warehouse, um, who cares if it drops a tote? Well, it really matters to, you know, mobility and so on. Who cares if the robot falls or breaks? You know, the company, you know, efficiency, et cetera. But if you're in your, if you're 80 years old and in your own home and then the robot falls down the stairs and lands on you, then you care, right? And it can't do that. It has to be 99 point, you know, three nines or whatever it is. It has to be more reliable than a, another person that's helping in a home. And uh, it's going to be uh, some real work to get to that point so that that safety level of, of helping people who uh, depend on that help has to be a very high standard. In 20 years time, humanoid robots will be as prevalent as dogs and cats. That's my strong belief. I hope to see a future where humanoid robots are sufficiently developed where they can automate nearly everything a person can do, both physically and mentally. At this point in time, if we do achieve this, and when, you know, when we do achieve this, society at this point can be completely sustained by humanoid robot and machine generated wealth that allows us as people to then spend time on our hobbies, developing our relationships with friends and family, and com just com live a life of complete leisure. I think that'll be a huge turning point in society and I hope I'm here for that. What do you think is going to be critical to, to kind of make the integration a reality and to say, okay, hey, you know, there's going to be more acceptance. Obviously, there, we're coming from, many people are coming from a place of fear. Uh, so what are your thoughts about, you know, yes, if we see things that helps uh, the, you know, movies helps, but what, what are some of those core things that will, will bridge and bring more harmony to that relationship? Uh, it's all about trust. It's about having your devices, um, having your devices meet your expectations and not surprise you with things that you didn't expect. And it, it's not just devices and, and robots. That's universally true of humans too. So, you know, if you're in a city and then you see somebody acting in a certain way that's not what you expect, you give them some space, you know? 
And there's a lot. People are very good at detecting things that are a little bit wrong. And I would say that's where, have you heard, the, have you heard about the uncanny valley? Is that a t- term that's familiar? So just for everybody in the audience, um, uncanny valley is things that look a bit like us, like a stuffed animal, something where you can kind of identify it. It, 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 people like it a lot, but as you get closer and closer and closer and more similar to a person, you get to a point where it's a little too close, where at first you think it might be a person, but then you identify things that are wrong with it and, and you hate it. People hate that. It's totally creepy and it's scary. And that's called the uncanny valley. That's kind of the, um, you know, the point at which things are wrong. And look, I don't know, another example I've heard, predators are really, really good at detecting uh, when prey animals have a slight limp in their gait, right? How would you detect that? That's so nuanced. Scientifically, how do we detect that? It's very, very hard to identify what feature is it that's a little bit off or something like that. But humans and animals are good at seeing when something is a little bit unexpected. And I would just, you know, build off of, you know, the topic of the uncanny valley. Something that made the now robot from Aldebaran and SoftBank so successful was because we found that right balance of, it looks like a human, but it's also very consciously designed not to have you know prominent facial features and we found this to be really impactful especially working with children uh, on the autism spectrum you know the fact that this robot could be highly repeatable its tone never changed you know we derive so much you know information from people's faces hey are you frustrated in working with me are you tired are you bored are you you know just mad at you know my inability to kind of keep up a robot that lacks some of those prominent facial features we found was really productive in, you know, helping nonverbal children on the autism spectrum feel comfortable to now work with a robot uh, and, you know, grow some of those skills. And so it was just, yeah, it's really important to find that that appropriate balance. And to go one step further, Jeff, I mean, your your concept of what bridges that gap and creates that harmony well, I'll take it back to what, you know, Louis Sentis has talked about, which is, you know, this concept of, you know, intervention and self-efficacy, and then also drawing in what Jonathan talked about, which is, you know, that foundation of trust. You know, humans are innately flawed in, you know, our decision making. You know, we have good judgment, we have good instincts, and but we're not always right. And yeah, what is that appropriate balance of a robot kind of intervening and saying, hey, you're about to make a decision that computationally... I don't think is in your best interest, you know, that I've, I've run the numbers of, you know, calculated the scenario and I'm going to intervene here because you're about to make a bad choice. I think that harmony is established when there is a, a strong degree of trust and also, you know, robots learn and how to intervene in really tactful and appropriate ways. To kind of close out just a few more questions, Jonathan, one for you is, you know, what would you recommend for those that do want to get involved in this space? You've been in the space for a long time. It's obviously a deep passion, mm-hmm. you know, bridging academia and business. Uh, any recommendations for those that, that want to get started? Um, so there's a ton of uh, dimensions to doing robotics in general and certainly a robotics business. So I don't know that the, the advice is do the thing that you're really, really good at and excited about. And if it's related, you know, whatever kind of engineering it is, whatever kind of business approach it is, if you're excited about it, you're going to be good at it. And, um, you know, there's going to be a place and, and it's, it's big teams of people that are just required in order to do these things. So it's, it's being able to work well with others and um, be really good at something you're excited about. That's it. James, for you, you had mentioned uh, your father. Um, you had benefited from, from robot surgery, and that sounded really meaningful. Um, what, is some of the, what are some of the cooler things you kind of hope to see in the future as far as you know, human-centric robots really hel- helping humans? You know, again, I think it comes back to just a... a passion of mine, which is, you know, seeing robots being able to help our elderly. Um, You know, I think when we talk about trust, when we talk about, you know, robots being programmed for for good things and good purposes, um, that's going to be a a huge burden or lift of, you know, burden on so many. Um, You know, right now we we see so many people who have to quit their jobs and become full-time, you know, caregivers for their parents because, there's not others who can do that and do that well and do that with a high degree of acceptance and trust for the member who's needing all of that support. And so, um, you know, when I think of, you know, the very, you know, promising future of human centric robots, I think it starts with, you know, entering robots into the home and doing really 
valuable things for for our elderly and our aging population. I think that if we can do that really well, that's going to garner a remarkable amount of trust and, you know, you know, positivity around the space and, and what the future holds. So I'm just excited to see that continuing to advance. And especially right now where, you know, nurses in hospitals, uh, bedside care, um, you know, hospitals are not making it attractive and easy for nurses. Certainly pandemics like COVID and others uh, are, are making it even harder. Uh, and so, again, robots in hospitals, you know, serving really valuable purposes and use cases is, you know, a, a layer of that. You know, you look at, you know, autonomous tugs and things that can transfer and move items, maybe beds within hospitals. You know, they, they've not succeeded because they're they're just large obstructive objects now that are in the way of, you know, the, the flow of a hospital. And so I think, again, being in a hospital is something where a human centric, you know, robot design is really going to prevail and, and be required. In fact, I want to thank you both for your, your, your devotion to this space. Um, you clearly, we, I clearly kind of hear and feel the, the passion that you have. And I think it's so exciting to think about w- where we are today the opportunity to kind of start moving the needle and to go faster. And I want to thank you both for uh, joining the show. It's been great to get your insights and uh, think about uh, how you can continue to impact our future. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Thank you. you. This was a great conversation. Enjoyed this. This is always a fun topic and it's worth having more of these conversations. You know, when we get back to managing expectations, socializing and making people comfortable with the prospect of this future, uh, more of these conversations are important. So thank you as well, Jeff. Thank you both. The Future of Podcasts is brought to you by Fresh Consulting. To find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future, visit us at freshconsulting.com. Make sure to search for the future of an Apple podcast, Spotify, Google podcast, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.